Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to look at a couple of different things um, in physical science, including talking about accuracy, precision, and significant figures. So we're going to look at those and go over some examples of those for this class. So let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing I want to look at is accuracy and precision. So these mean two different things. And what we have here is an example with some targets. And what we have is that accuracy is how close you are to the correct value. So in this case, accurate would mean that you are close to the center of the target. So you can see that this one here would be relatively accurate. And actually two being relatively accurate, the next most accurate one would be this one. This one shows that the they're scattered around the central portion, but there's a very wide dispersion in the values themselves. And that leads us to the second portion, which is precision. Precision is how close the measurements are repeated to each other. So something with high precision is going to have a very tight cluster of uh, values. And we see that again in this one here, the one in the lower right hand side is a very high precision. So we can look at these and show that precision increases as you move to the right. So those on the left have a very low precision. So these would be low. And these would be a high precision the ones on the right. Now accuracy would be increasing as you move downward. So this would be the accuracy. And these would have a low accuracy. They are nowhere near the central portions of the target. And these would have a higher accuracy. So you can have things with a high accuracy and high precision. And that's when you get a tightly grouped uh, cluster right around the central portion of the target. You can also have things with low precision and low accuracy where the objects are all scattered all over and not grouped around the center of the target. But you can also get combinations of these where you can get high accuracy but low precision where things are scattered all over the place but still centered around the central target. And you can get things with a low accuracy and a high precision. You're getting a tightly grouped uh, cluster here, but it's not uh, grouped around the center. So there's something off and that may tell you something about how you're making your measurements or your measurement device. So let's move on and talk a little bit about uncertainty. And uncertainty tells us how much the values, the measured values, deviate from the expected values. Anything we measure contains some uncertainty. So we can never measure anything with exact values. And that means that if we were to take a board and have every student in a class measure it, that if there were 20 students in the class, we'd pretty much get 20 different values for the uncertainty for the measurement. And that would tell us something about the uncertainty. And let's look at an example here. If we want to measure something 250 meters with an uncertainty of 10 meters, that means it could be the value could be anywhere between 240 meters and 260 meters. And we write that as plus or minus the error. So 250 meters as being our best estimated value. But we write it as plus or minus 10 meters, meaning that it could be 10 meters either direction. So it's a way of putting an error estimate into our measurements here. Now, as we continue to look at this, then we want to call what we have the percent uncertainty. So how can we formalize this uncertainty? We often give a percent uncertainty. And we define that as given in the equation here that the percent uncertainty is equal to the change or the error in the value divided by the expected value itself and multiplied by 100%. So delta A is the uncertainty in the measurement of A, whatever that is. So let's look at an example here. A board is measured to be 8.0 plus or minus 
two meters. So what is the percent uncertainty? So we can calculate that. But first we need to figure out what our values are. So our first value we want to look at what is a well a is eight meters and delta a is 0.2 meters and we get those right from our measurement uncertainty given here. Now we need our equation which says that the percent uncertainty is equal to delta a divided by a times 100. So we put the values and then we put the values in for this that we had. So the percent uncertainty is 0.2 divided by 8 times 100. And then we continue. Now we divide 0.2 by 8 and we get 0 0.025. And that gives us our percent uncertainty. And then when we multiply it by 100. So this gives us the fractional uncertainty here. And then when we multiply it by 100, we get 2.5% as being our percent uncertainty. So we just take those values that we've given. So that gives the uncertainty as a percentage of the actual value. So two different ways we can look at uncertainties. And this way gives us a little bit of a variety and shows us how far off we might be. Now the other thing I want to look at for this lecture is to take a look at significant figures. So what are significant figures? Well, there are some numbers that are exact. And for example, there are 12 eggs in a dozen. There are two wheels on a bicycle. These have as many significant figures as you need. They are exact. That is not just 12. It is 12 with precisely. And if everybody in a class were to count the number of eggs in a full dozen eggs, we would all get 12. There wouldn't be any error associated with that. However, if I were to pass around a board and have everybody measure the length of that board, we would get different values for each each person measuring it. It would be slightly different. We'd find a rough value as an average, but we'd see that there are some measurement errors associated with it. So what is the true length of the board? Well, we only know it to a certain accuracy. So anything that's measured is an estimate and using different instruments instruments you might measure a piece of paper to be different value different sizes. So using a very rough instrument you may measure it to be 220 millimeters. If you have something a little bit more accurate you might get 218. So you've added a significant figure you've gone from two significant figures to three significant figures. If you have an even more accurate measuring device, you might might find out that that's actually 217.6. And we're now up to four significant figures. So it can depend on the accuracy of the measuring device. So some things are going to be easier to measure. Uh, more accurately. So if we want to use, for example, a ruler to measure something a size, we will get one we will get one value. But if we use a caliper, a more accurate measuring device, we might be able to measure it to another decimal place and increase the number of significant figures in the measurement. However, there's still always an error associated with it. So how do we determine how many significant figures are in a number? Well, let's look at our rules here and we're going to look at this in two different ways. First, I'm giving you a list of the rules here and then I'll show a flow chart on the following page that kind of gives you a way to be able to determine whether numbers are what numbers are significant. So starting off with the rules here, non zero digits, that means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight or nine are always significant. It doesn't matter where they appear in the number. The next rule is that leading zeros are never significant. You can put a zero before a number and it does not matter. So when you're looking at a number going from left to right, there are no significant figures until you get to the first non zero number. And we're going to look at some examples of these coming up. Embedded zeros which means zeros between appearing between any non zero digits are significant. So if we have 305 as an example, we know that the three and the five are significant, but so is the zero because it is in between those two. Now, the, the tougher one is the trailing zeros and one that we have to look at some examples of. They are significant only 
and only if the decimal point is specified. So if we can have two different numbers, 300 and 300.0. Now this one has no decimal point that would have one significant figure. This one has a decimal point, And that means it has four significant figures. So when we put that decimal point and that zero there, all of these zeros become significant. When there is no decimal point in the number, then those are not significant. We're just saying that this rounds to 300. And finally, when we look at scientific notation, all digits to the left of the power of 10 are significant. So we don't include the power of 10 itself. That is not part of it. That's really just representing a bunch of zeros. But all the digits to the left of it are significant. So let's look at this as a flow chart and then look at a few examples to go over this. So here's a flow chart that may help you to go through these. You start out up at the top and pick out your number. So as you look at each number in the in the each digit within the number you're looking at, it's going to be one of these 10 digits, something 0 through 9. Well, you follow the flow chart, and is it a 1 through 9? Then it's significant, and you know that part, that digit is significant. So everything comes up if you're looking at a 0. So if you look at a 0, then it splits off three ways. And two of those are very easy to look at. First of all, if it's at the front of the number, so in other words, before you get to any other non zero digit in the number, it is never significant. It doesn't matter the number if the zero is at the front, it doesn't matter whether it's a very big number or a very small number, those zeros are not significant. If it is between two other non zero digits, then it is always significant. And we looked at the example of 305 last time. That zero was in between two non zero digits, which, may, which makes it significant. So those two are relatively easy. The only place there's a choice is where it comes to the end of a number. And this is where we want to look. If it has a decimal point, then those zeros at the end of a number are significant. If it does not contain a decimal point, then those digits are never significant. So you can keep this flow chart as a way of helping to remind you uh, how many significant figures are in a number. So let's take a look at some examples of this uh, to give you a little bit of practice. So if we want to look at a few, we have, for example, let's start off with 300. And I talked about this one already. 300 has one significant figure. There's no decimal point. So the only significant figure in it is the 3. However, if we write that as 300.0, all of a sudden it has four significant figures. Why? Because we've added this decimal point. That decimal point means that all of those figures are significant. So it goes from being one significant figure without the decimal point to being four significant figures with it. Now let's look at a small number. And an example of that is the one I've given here, 0. 0.000052. How many significant figures does that have? Well, remember our rules. First of all, leading zeros are never significant. So these zeros are not significant and are not counted for significant figures. These two, on the other hand, are non-zero, so they do count. And that gives us two significant figures. Now you can't just get rid of these. We need them as placeholders to get the five and the two into the right decimal point. So they're important, but they do not count for significant figures. We just need them there as the placeholders. Uh, just as we needed a placeholder here, we can't just get rid of these two zeros because there would be a big difference between the number three and the number 300. So even though they're not significant, they are still needed as placeholders. Our next example, how many significant figures do we have here? Well, this is going to have seven significant figures. Why? Well, we have some non zero digits here, one, two, five, and four, and we have three zeros. All of those zeros are in between non zero digits, and that makes them significant. So everything in this number is significant, giving it seven significant figures. Our next example, we look at 0. 0.2000. How many significant figures? 
Well, leading zeros never significant. So this zero is not significant. This is non zero, which makes it significant. And these are trailing zeros. And if you remember trailing zeros are significant only if a decimal point is specified in the number. So since there is a decimal point in the number there, these are significant and that gives us four significant figures. Now, Finally, we can look at another one, and that is one in scientific notation. And if you remember in scientific notation, the power of 10 is really just a bunch of zeros placeholding telling us uh, where the number how big the number is. So this does not count for significant figures, but it is still important. There's a big difference between 6.58 and 6.58 times 10 to the eighth. However, for significant figures, we only look at the portion to the left, and all of those are always significant, and that gives us three significant figures. Now our final example here uh, looks at the number 12. How many significant figures does this have? Well, if we look at it as a measured value, it would be two significant figures, one and two. However, if it's an exact number, if it is counting the number of eggs in a dozen, then it has an infinite number of significant figures. So one of the things we have to look at is where the number is coming from. Is it a measured value, in which case it has a certain number of significant figures? Or is it a simple counting value, in which case it could have an infinite number of significant figures? And we'll see this in some equations. Uh, for example, the area of a uh, sorry the volume of a sphere is equal to four thirds pi r cubed now that volume in this case four thirds is an exact number so that's 1.3 repeating and those are exact numbers and go on forever and ever as far as you want Pi is known to as many digits as you want. So the only thing that you need to look at for significant figures in this case would be the radius. That would be what you would be measuring. And that would be the measured value involved here. And that would determine how many significant figures you have in your volume. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now we want to look at some how do we do calculations in significant figures. So how do we keep track of how many significant figures are going to be in an answer? Well, the rules vary depending on whether you are multiplying or dividing or adding or subtracting. And we're going to look at an example of each of these. But let's discuss how they work first of all. And they're quite different. When you're adding or subtracting, the last digit is determined by the input number that is most estimated. So it ends at the highest place value. So if one number ends in the ones place and another number adds in the tenths place and you're adding those two together, your value would end in the ones place. And I'll go over an example showing this in just a moment. When you multiply or divide, you look at the each number of significant figures in each of the two numbers going into that. And your final answer will have no more significant figures than the answer or than the input number with the least number of significant digits. So we look at how many significant figures each of the input numbers has. And then we use that to determine how many significant figures will be in the answer. Now, it helps to see these as an example. So let's take a look at each of these. And first of all, we look at the example of 2.583 times 6.28 times 10 to the fifth. So let's go ahead and write that out. Now the first step you do is just to do the multiplication. Don't worry about the significant figures yet. So we'll figure that out at the end. What we need to do is multiply those two numbers. And if you do that, you get 1,622,124. So that's our answer. But as we see there, that has a lot of significant figures in it. That's got a lot of digits in it, whereas these ones did not have very many. So let's look at how many significant figures were present in each of those first two numbers. 2.583 has four significant figures. They're all non-zero, so each of those is significant. 6.28 times 10 to the fifth has three significant figures. So what does that mean for our answer? Well, our answer must have the least of these or our answer must have three significant figures. So how do we write that answer? 
Well, we can write it in two different ways. We can put in placeholder zeros so we can just keep the first three digits and then add placeholder zeros down to the decimal point, which would give us 1,620,000. Or we could write it in scientific notation as 1.62 times 10 to the sixth. Either of those would be perfectly acceptable. They both have three significant figures and they both give the same number. So you just have to be careful. You don't want to drop things off. You don't want to just write this as 162 because then you are changing the value of the number. You need those placeholder zeros in order to keep the number as about 1.62 million. So writing 162 would be far writing a quite a different number. Now let's look at another example of addition with using addition and subtraction. And what we have here, I've given you the values of uh, 25.1 minus 45.1 plus 16.31. Now when we do these we always follow order of operations and that means that you have to watch out in this one because a lot of people use uh, if you remember PEM DAS which means that you look at various things in order. So you look at First, for anything in parentheses that doesn't apply here. Then exponentials there's nothing applied there. Multiplication and division are one unit as are addition and subtraction. So multiplication and division are done from left to right. You don't do multiplication first and then division. And addition and subtraction are done from left to right. So you do addition and subtraction from left to right. You don't do addition before subtraction. So you have to keep track of that and remember that addition does not does not take priority of over subtraction. Those two are equal as you move from left to right. So when you calculate this, if you actually add and subtract these numbers, you would get negative 0.09. So now we have to decide where this stops. Where do we put this as a for significant figures? So right now it has one significant figure, but when we're adding and subtracting, we don't look at the number of significant figures. We have to look at the decimal place. So we want to look at each of those three input numbers and where they stop. So 25.1 stops at the tenths place. 41.5 stops at the tenths place. And 16.31 stops at the hundredths place. So the least of those is the tenths place. So we want to, our answer then must stop at the tenths place. And that means we have to round our number to the tenths place. And that would be negative 0.1 for our answer. So we have to watch when you're doing addition and subtraction, things can be a little bit different. And even though we had, for example, three significant figures here, three here and four here, our final answer only has one significant figure because we have to stop at the tenths place. It just turns out that all the other numbers happen to cancel. So we would not use 0.09, even though it still has one significant figure. When we're adding and subtracting, we have to round to the number that has the uh, least decimal place. And that would be in this case negative 0.1. So I just wanted to go over a couple examples here for you as a review. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary. And what we find is we talked about accuracy and precision, which can tell us something about our measurements. And depending on exactly what kind of accuracy and precision we're getting. We talked about measurements uncertainty and we can express this as either an error plus or minus something or as a percent uncertainty. And finally, we looked at significant figures and went over some examples. And these are important because all measurements do have an uncertainty associated with them. So that concludes this lecture on ac accuracy, precision and significant figures. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day, everyone. And I will see you in class.